I don't care who you are. If Paul Macbeth is throwing shade, I'd be scared. Or it was a simple editing mistake. That and everything you need to know from round one of the Texas State Championship. What's up, Disgenerates? It's the Disc Golf World. I'm Jefferson. Alongside me, as always, the one with all the holes in his game, Swiss Cheese. Before we get into the tournament talk, a fan sent us a clip that we had to investigate. At first, I saw the Paul Macbeth Tour Series video on my YouTube recommendations and scrolled past it for another one of those Try Guys videos. Thanks for getting me hooked, Cynthia. But after hearing the goat through some shade, you bet I had to check it out. But soon I grew bored after he was just tossing some frisbees, which normally would be pretty cool. But there's no way I was going to drop that type of cash on some special edition discrap plastic that feels the same as the other 73 versions they've already released. So I decided to look down at the comment section and see what all the fuss was about. That was until he started throwing the Zone OS, which prompted this reaction from him. Why is the exact same? Nowhere. Not all that positive as you saw. Many fans are speculating that it's because of the beef between him and Brody Smith. Although if you remember, Paul has small hands, so it makes sense he wouldn't like it. And can't forget about this gem. The Zone OS, officially approved. Have you had any first impressions with it? I'm not a big fan of it, but that's just my personal preference. It is one of those discs where <clears throat> everyone's going to want to own one. How many people really use it? I don't know. Plus, the Zone OS is a top 5 worst disc on the market, and it's not number 5. However, that's not what fans were talking about. Rather, they noticed that every other Tour Series disc, he mentioned the players whose disc it was. Listen closely as I roll the Zone OS clip. Here we go, Adam Hammond's Zone. I will say this feels better than, what was it, the Z that came out last year or something like that. The Chris Dickerson Buzz. Cicada, one of my favorite drivers to throw right now. Paige Pierce Passion. Holland Hamley Vulture. Missy Gannon Thrash. Scorch. In my opinion, it's a very similar fight, but these are tend to be a little bit more beefy. Aaron Gossett, Raptor. Coriolis Force. Anthony Barella, Venom. The Ezra Ader Hold. Nuke. Notice how he casually forgets to say Brody's name? About as sneaky as Gannon Burr joining Discmania this offseason. The comments section was filled with people calling Paul out. The reactions varied from people thinking it was funny to others calling him petty. If you're confused, Brody and Macbeth have some history that is still unknown to the public, but this fueled the fire under the community to remember it again. This is kind of a funny situation though, because people are going to comment under this video that I'm creating drama by sharing this news, even though again, plenty of people are heated about it. Have you been reading the comments popping up? At least I was smart enough to realize Paul also doesn't mention Valerie Mondahano when throwing the Scorch, or Jomez Pro when he threw their disc either. Hannah, the editor, even made a comment to clarify that Paul mentioned Brody and those other players in a longer intro, but she cut it out for the video's sake. If you people really think Paul is wasting his time thinking of ways to go after Brody, I hate to break it to you, but that's not happening. Plus, I think Pablo could do a good enough job if need be. I don't think the six-time world champion was throwing shade at Brody Smith, who is currently in 109th place going 4 for 13 from inside the circle. That's not an insult either. That's just a fact. And your feelings don't care about those, I'm afraid. Even he couldn't blame PDGA Live. Shout out to Rito DG for keeping us informed. We appreciate that, and if anyone else wants us to cover something, feel free to hit us up. Now, here's Swiss with the Day 1 FPO recap. Guys, when Owen Scoggin speaks, we all need to shut up, listen, and enjoy. When Owen tells us she is built differently, she means it. The week started off with a simple Monday early practice round photo that had many talking about concerns with injury maintenance, tour fatigue, and arm preservation. Owen put that all to rest with a bogey-free 11-under course record-setting round on day one to lead the entire field. For someone who came into the contest worried about her putt with windy conditions in the forecast, there was little to no concern on the course today, even with some strong winds. When you are parking nearly 40% of the holes, wind becomes a non-factor, though. We have seen Owen lead and take down an event in dominating fashion already this year, and her day one performance definitely saw some similar glimpses of her taking over the Open at Austin. The wind gust might be stronger tomorrow than today, but with her experience and game, it will be difficult for any competitor to track her down. And even when she missed two putts during the round, they had little effect on her score, as she stacked birdies throughout the 18 holes. Her three birdies on the final three holes, including a big C2 putt on 18, was needed to take a single-stroke lead on Norway's Anakin Christensen Steen, who was able to put together her highest-rated round on the season and earned her first lead card in the States. Her bogey after going OB on hole 9 was the difference between her and Owen, yet Anakin's putt looked strong on day 1, only missing a single putt from C2 on the round. 
It will be interesting to see how Anakin will handle the pressure of being on lead card. Her skills have already been displayed, but her response to pressure is still an unknown factor. Holland Hanley has had some up and down performances this season, hopping in and off lead cards in nearly every tournament. After kicking off the season with back-to-back third place finishes, has followed that up with a 16th and a 10th place finish with some damaging scores creating those results. Today, her game was smooth, controlled, consistent, and most importantly, clean. Hit all but one fairway on the day and was a slightly better putting percentage from C2 from possibly being in the lead. Yet her nearly 40-footer on hole 18 was not only a huge putt, but also placed her in a solo third position with a 9-under round. If there's one in the pack that has the best odds of catching own, I'd have to give it to Holland. Far too many people realize her talent, yet it hasn't translated to victories apart from the throw pink win that was marred with all that occurred on 18. Can she maintain her clean play while still pressing to score to catch own? We'll need to wait and see. Sarah Holcomb shot an 8-under clean round herself, not only getting into a solo fourth place, but was also the strongest off the tee on the day, leading in both C1 and C2 regulation. Though she may not have parked as many holes as her tomorrow's card mates, she found herself in C2 or better for all 18 holes, which allowed her to remain clean even though she two-putted from C1X to bookend her round on holes 1 and 18. Her putt will need to improve if she wants to push for the win, however. The round saw the lowest amount of bogeys since Portland last year, so there was plenty of scoring to be had. Almost like your guy talked about this exact scenario in Friday's Twig. As much as it's good to see some scoring in the FPO, there still is separations from Owen's dominating round. The only other player who can make a push at this point is Kat Merch. She'll need to limit her errors to have a chance to move up the ranks from her fifth place she currently finds herself. Beth at 69. I just told myself, you've got to will this one in there. Whatever you have, just will it in there. This man, unbelievable. This is what athletes live for. This is the moment. Over on the MPO side, Anthony DeBarella would claim his fifth lead card going into round two after finishing day one in solo possession of first place with a hot 10 under. Even more impressive, it included two bogeys. When AB's putter is hot, he can put up some crazy rounds, and going 12 for 12 from C1X sounds like he did just that, without a C2 either. So if he can start making putts from deep and stay in bounds, he should stack some good rounds in the less windy conditions. Both of his bogeys came from OB drives. If he's not careful, that could continue to be a problem, although we have seen AB handle these situations better than any other season, even with big names chasing him down. Barella would finish the final six holes all for birdie, which I would recommend remembering for when the final day comes rolling in. Calvin Heinberg started his round about the worst way possible, finding an early tree on hole one that would result in a bogey, followed by an OB drive on hole two for another bogey. Quickly, he bounced back with three birdies in a row until finding trouble on hole six after another OB drive for his third and final bogey of the round. But if you didn't know, Calvin is actually allergic to pars, so he'd just go on and birdie hole seven through 11, which four of those birdies would be within 15 feet. Six under, ending tied for second with a nine down with three other players. If Calvin can find his groove, he could be dangerous. Even without a forehand, he is showing that he can put up great rounds. He mentioned at the press conference that he used to hardly throw sidearms, so the transition might not be as drastic as it was for other players facing the same injury. Mason Ford finds himself in another solid position early in a tournament with a 9 down himself. However, his was without any bogeys. His average putt coming in at 10 feet with 5 bullseye birdies helping him out. Apparently, Mason likes his birdies in pairs, so if he can get into a rhythm, I don't see this course being too much of an issue. The key is to stay in balance and hit putts as they come. Ezra Aderhold was right there with him with four bullseye putts of his own. He actually would make more C2 putts on the day than he did circle one, going two for three in C1X while he went four for eight from outside. Those 34-foot steppers have really been dialed in. Gannon Burr ended the round with 11 birdies, although two unfortunate bogeys early would cost him. Finding the hazard on hole two, that makes me scratch my head. Comment below what the hazard would know sand or anything looks like on TV because from behind the ropes, looks whack, but what do I know? Well, besides Bird dropping in 11 out of his 12 C1X looks. With the wind looking down for tomorrow's round, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Gannon light this course up. If we're being honest though, as disc golf fans and AB, Heimberg, and Burr lead card makes up for the fact Mason Ford will be there. Sorry, Mason. I was just kidding, but the joke just wrote itself. 
Robert Burge, the Houston suburb native, had quite the homecoming on day one. With all the attention of Chase Card and the gallery following, he and Anthony Barella. Shooting 8 under and currently tied with Nathan Queen for 6th place which is certainly impressive under those conditions. And the day started off with a shaky start, having to two-putt from C1 on the first hole and scramble the very next hole to save par. From there, Burge was able to regain control of his round on the familiar track and notch eight birdies with no bogeys for the remaining of the round. With him having to respond on the first two holes and the fact he went over from C2, there is some room for Burge to compete, but he will need to play to the best of his abilities over the next two days. Nathan Queen, who tied Burge, had to put in a lot more work, however, for that score. Sure, he started three down on the first three holes, but he was forced to scramble three separate times to save par, while also needing to hit three C2 two putts all for birdies. The field is extremely tight and Nathan will need to certainly clean up his play if he wants to push for a podium finish with some of the best in the game ahead and chasing behind. 7 under must have been the sweet spot as 5 players are sitting tied for 8th place rounding out the current top 10. Jake Hubenheimer showing Lone Star why he should have been the one representing the brand rather than 38th place Nico Castro or 42nd Carter Aarons. Maybe they'll consider, but the 4 OB strokes might still be holding him back as he would be 100% from C1X, going 11 for 11 and even hitting two of his three putts from circle two. Fellow teammate AJ Carey wanting some of that love as well, as he would be eight down going into hole 16, where he would find his first bogey of the round. Followed up with a birdie, but an unfortunate OB drive on 18 would result in another bogey. Chris Clemens found success in the putting green, pushing him up the leaderboard going nine for 11 inside C1X and found a few other birdies from deep. Randon Lada capitalized on his looks in the circle, missing only one of his 10 C1X putts. If that can translate next round and he can connect from C2, he'll be finer than his looks on an episode of Donnie's Drip. Gavin Rathbun showing everyone a sponsor is overrated with a bogey-free 7 down hitting every C1X putt, going 8 for 8, but pairing that with 4 putts from outside the circle to round out the top 8 heading into day 2. Now for some round one quick hitters. No, it's not a mistake. Cupcake must have hit the snooze button one too many times as he ended his round at 24 over. As he missed the first six holes resulting in par plus four. Evan Smith would have a rocky round but would snag the eagle on hole 17 with a 230 foot throw in for two on the 717 foot par four. Lucky Lorenzen finishes her round the best possible way. Skipping it in the bucket for a one. Looks like Owen called it at the press conference, which you should check out if you haven't already. No, not the hour and a half long nonsense. Get the highlights minus the fluff only on the Disc Golf World. Bear Bite is using his ace magic to get Gannon Burr's second win of the season. I suggest you go find your local bookie right now. Fern makes Ricky some juice this morning. Maybe skip out on that tomorrow. Kind of like Haley King who took this weekend off to show all you 40-year-old noobs how to stop sucking at Fortnite. Bradley Williams still thinks people are watching his daily round recaps over on Instagram. I'll save you some time. He's tied for 66th at even. That's everything you need to know from round one of the Texas State Championships. If you don't want to miss out on round two's recap, make sure to like and subscribe. It's the easiest way to support the channel. Oh, and if you want to know more about the million dollar disc golf tournament, check out the video right here.